The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Welcome to the Growth Series, which we're cheekily calling Ensemble on Tour, recorded live at the Future Proof Festival in Huntington Beach, California. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and alongside Adele Martin, we're bringing you right into the heart of this one-of-a-kind outdoor wealth management festival. Across these episodes, we'll be sharing practice development and business growth insights, along with standout conversations, surprises, and key takeaways from some of the brightest minds in finance, fintech, and beyond. Get ready to hear who we met, what we learned, and what we're bringing back to Australia. Let's dive in. Hello, folks. It's Peter and Adele here again today. It's day two of Future Proof. Now, you're going to need to forgive us a little. It is the evening. We have had a gloriously scrumptious Mexican meal. So we're for a little slow on the uptake. It's because our bellies are full. It's been a big couple of days already. So, you know, bear with us if you don't mind. So, Adele, let's dive into, first of all, these sort of unusual things that happened today, right? So we had, aside from content, and guys, we'll get to the content, but we had these two things. One was these talks that you could go and attend, and one was meetings. You went first up, I think, right, to one of these talks. Talk us through, well, like, how, how did it work, and then how you found it. So the talks were you with your um, peers, and there were small tables of, you know, five to eight people on each okay. table. It was a big room, um, but there was lots of different topics. So I chose the uh, AI one. And you chose that beforehand, right? Yeah. That was something you put your hand up for. Free reds. Right. Got there early, nice and early, 8 a.m. It went for about an hour. Okay. So I, yeah, so I love the concept of it because Mm -hmm. I think there's not enough of that collaboration that happens, you know, with advisors. We don't know what other people are doing. Yeah. I love that they had some questions on the table to help facilitate the discussion. Nice. Get it going. What I thought... And so I'd love to see the concept of like this in Australia, but what I thought could have maybe been better is they matched it by skill level. Yes. Because I had a lot of beginners on my table. Oh, uh, sorry. Tell us, share us the topic for yours. Yeah. So I was all around AI and how people using AI. And they, and they, and they were, I forgot this thing. Uh, they, none of them, they were just starting to think about using AI file notes and they were a little bit worried about recording their meeting. So okay. I, I feel like they were very much at the beginning, beginning. of their, yeah. And so... Uh, yeah, so that to me was, I think they could have just maybe paired you with your beginner level. Beginner as guys or something. Like, yeah. yeah. And and that would probably apply to a few different topics, wouldn't it? So, yeah, because some people will be going there, go, oh, I'm a bit curious about this versus others. Oh, I want to collaborate with other, you know, super keen people like me and hear what they're doing. So that's a fair point. I think for it to really work, you could probably have less topics, but have for each topic a beginner or an advanced or something, yes. yeah, because yeah, it all had that... multiple tables on AI on this particular topic. Yeah, okay. they could have done it. Yeah, yeah, okay, interesting. So then I participated in the other little interesting thing they did, which was um, meetings. So once again, bef- well before the event, you put your hand up and said, "Okay, I'm interested in um, certain types of topics." But instead of putting you at a table of people, they set you up with a little meeting one on one. Basically, you you showed interest in the topics and then other people could say, yes, I'd love to meet with Peter, and then I could accept their request. Um, it's a weird sort of dating exercise, to be honest. It's it's a little awkward and strange. Um, I allowed... Oh, so this group... Put, so, folks, I think... I th- Was there like 600 tables? Yeah. It was huge, right? So it was three, three big tents, because remember, this is an outdoor festival. So three big tents of about 200 tables in each tent and it's got a little number on it. You go find your number and there's your date for the 15 minutes and you talk for 15 minutes. I'll be honest, I was super sceptical. I thought, this is a bit weird, maybe even borderline creepy. But actually, my first one, bless his cotton socks, was a gentleman from the UK and I'm going to get his name, Neil Bage. I am hope I'm saying that was his surname right, but he's from a behavioural finance business that helps advisors become coaches and and know more about behavioral finance and we had like the best meeting of minds you've ever seen like i can imagine us having all sorts of conversations in the future so i think i was really lucky that the first one was fabulous 
Uh, the second one I had was actually with an Aussie, uh, the lovely Danelle Parkin, and she was asking me about tech and going virtual and things like that. So I think you'd have to go in knowing it would be give and take. Some some meetings um, you'd get a lot out of them, and other meetings you'd be giving a lot. But I think it could be really interesting. I think it could be a great concept to bring to Australia. We'll yes. think about like fund managers. It could be a way to vent that they get to talk to advisors more. Uh, I think it would get, yeah, you know, I think it could be a great way. But they had like this with over these three days, there's going to be 32,000 one on one meetings. Right. Like they just go hard. And the reason they do this, right? So, so based, so, uh, you know, Adele and I are a bit different. We've paid to come to this conference. Whereas if you're an American advisor, you can have the ticket price waived if you do. And I think it was like 20 or 30 of these meetings, 20, I think, meetings. Um, so you've got to be willing to to do that. It doesn't mean you miss out on content. These are all in bands of time that are assigned to it. Um, but when you think about it, when you think about sponsors at the events we go to, physical events, they're at those booths and you've got to go up to the booths and everything. But really what the sponsors want to do is get some time with you and 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 get that meeting maybe down the track. Whereas this just says, well, we know that's what you want. Let's just set them up bulk and have those conversations. So, And you know what? I quite like the idea with fund managers of doing a whole lot of them in a row because it can be quite interruptive during the year. Mm. So to have, yep, all right, I'm going to revisit my investment methodology. I'm going to set up ten of these things, one after the other. Tell me what you can in 50 minutes. I quite like it, you mm. know. Um, yeah, and it's grown in popularity year on year. Yes. Heat scheme. So it is something that's very popular with the advisors. Really popular. So I could see two distinct streams. One would be product providers matched with advisors, but the other could be advisors or, or coaches or experts match with advisors. So I think you could have a, two quite different streams. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we got a bit, it was it was interesting. It, certainly both of us thought, ooh, there's certainly a way we could do this back home. Yes. Without a doubt. Now then, I believe you had a really good session. You went to Adele Michael, who we all love. Is it Kitsis? I'm going to say his name wrong. Michael Kitches. Kitches. Yeah. There yeah. we go. Yeah. We all know. Yeah. You've got, if you don't know who he is, please Google him. His surname is spelled K-I-T-C-E-S. He is the godfather of financial advice. Yeah. And so, so talk to us about this. So he talked about what metrics you should be tracking in your business in okay. to know if you're you know, doing well. So he, interesting here, Americans, a lot, a lot of Americans still talk about their thumb. Uh, right. But A-U-M. Yeah. yeah. A-U-M. And so he said that that is not an indication of your, you know, success or profitability or anything like that. And so he had things like revenue per advisor, revenue per client as the benchmarks that you should be tracking. Yep. And so the sort of, uh, so yeah, I thought that was, was super interesting. Um, what I loved though, what, what I sort of took away as a big sort of aha moment for me was the data showed that, so most people think that, and I've seen the couple with advisors, that as they get bigger and what they'll do is to be able to grow and scale, they'll put on another advisor and that other advisor will deal with their smaller clients, their lower paying clients, right. how they're going to grow and scale. And so he said, well, that that actually is not what the data shows at all. In fact, your cost has gone up. He said, the big firms, the ones that grow, they don't scale by looking after more clients. They scale because they've increased their fees. Right. So they're doing more for them. Yeah. Well, so charging more because you yeah, you're better, but also because you're doing more for them. Yeah, so we're talking yeah. about solving you know thousand dollar problems. They just solve bigger problems now. So he said all of the data shows that that is how they're you know bigger and more profitable is that their fees are you know per client are more expensive. So mm. I thought that to me was a very interesting takeaway. And yeah, he had some really great stats. Um, yeah, I thought he was super fascinating, interesting. And so that might mean also that instead of you know, your next hire being another advisor, it might be a different specialty because you're just adding more value to your current client. Base. Yes. And he also talked about then upskilling, like, and those yeah. advisors, you might have to slightly, you know, pay more of their more technical sort of advisors is what he spoke about as well. Yeah. He's always good value, can I say? I've never been to one of his sessions and not thought it was um, really, really valuable. For those that haven't ever checked out his um, sort of, he's got a great blog, it's worth following, but also... He does this horribly sort of minutia map of all the tech, advice mm-hmm. tech, and it, he puts it into categories. And that is, there's so much tech now. He's had to make the logo so tiny. You're going to go a bit blind looking at it. But he spends a lot of effort going into the technology and into, like you say, scale 
um, and understanding how you can do this stuff. So it's he's well worth a follow. Um, I would definitely encourage you to do that. So the next session, we both went to this one, was basically three, what I would, like the equivalent for us would be three smaller practice manage, or practice owners. So they were, they call them small RIAs. Am I saying that? Yeah. The RIAs. But basically, we, you know, the equivalent is just these small, you know, early growth um, practices. There may be a few staff, but it, quite small. And they were talking about, you know, can they be competitive and and what does all of that mean? What was what was some of your takeouts out of that session? So for me, I did quite like that session. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for me, the one that I took away was that they could change fast. Rather than thinking about all the drawbacks, of, you know, of, of being, being small. smaller. Yeah. First of all, the one that lady said, don't call it small, are they growing? I'm like, oh, that's a yeah. word, but yeah. small, that you're growing. You're so small. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, they're growing. But there's some advantages. The analogy should go with like a jet ski versus a cruise ship. The bigger firms are like a cruise ship when they really hard, like they do change and but they turn really slowly. So yeah. cruise ships turn slowly and that's how they change. They change really slowly. But the smaller firms or the growing firms are like jet skis. They can make decisions and turn quickly. Yes. And so I think, you know, sometimes we think about the, the positives of being, you know, smaller, more nimble, adapting. Um, she also said that they have more personalization. They also seem to niche more. The bigger firms don't seem to have the niche. All of those on stage all niched. Yes. And that was probably the message that I've heard at Nauseam this conference and just sort of reinforced what I already know, but it was nice to hear it, um, is that the niching is what was the tipping point to their success. Yes. Everything became easier when they niched. And interestingly, what I'm seeing, and look, this can be reflective of the fact that it is a bigger, bigger market here, right? I get that. But niching isn't just the demographics, right? Some of them niche in a particular part of advice. Some niche. This, like it's, this guy today was on my table. He niched in Indian immigrants coming on work visas to the US. Like it was so niche. Yes, <laughs> right. But imagine the service offering, how streamlined your comms could be. Like the whole thing would just, it'd it harm, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd just be such a slick operation because you're not trying to be everything to everybody. Um, interestingly, in that conversation too, that what came out that I hadn't fully grasped, I'll admit, up to this point was, they have a very low cost to entry here. So like the concept of just starting up your own advice practice with just you is completely viable. And in fact, all three people on the panel did that. That's how they started. But their view is that they've got a higher cost to organically grow because it's such a big marketplace here. So it's, it's, you'd really like to be heard. <laughs> it's much harder. Whereas I would argue we've got the reverse in Australia. I think we've got a massively high cost to entry now. Um, what with mm. study, PI, like just all of the things, <laughs> it's quite hard to start your own operation. But I would argue organic growth, given we've got a, a massive, you know, excessive demand over supply is probably not as much of an issue if we focus on it. Yeah. Um, the other thing that became clear, which I believe is happening in Australia too, there's lots of consolidation going on. Interestingly, I don't know whether you picked up on this, though the view is they're not all convinced that's a good thing. You're right. They sort of feel like, is this just the big guys gobbling up everybody and it's actually not going to be a better experience for the clients and may not even be more profitable because they don't get the culture right. They don't get the, you know, all that sort of stuff. Talk about the, you know, it was a relationship business. Yeah. And so when they got bigger, they lose that relationship. Right. And so they actually think that, well, big, and, you know, only time will tell that that model they think won't be. Long term sustainable, yeah. and you know what? We all see that even in uh, the bigger, say, the product providers or the banks, don't we? Like they go in this cycle where you know they're all buying each other, and then they all you know offshoots and they sell off, and like it's just it's probably the same thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, I've I quite um yeah I found that session quite interesting, and they although there was one thing we both com- turned to each other and commented on after that session, they were talking somebody cleverly I thought asked from the crowd. Hey, what was your first hire? Mm. And two of them, I think, out of the three, their first hire, and we're talking first hire, so it's them. They're just they're the ones operating. Their first hire was another advisor. Oh, and we're, but like, are you serious? What about some support staff? <laughs> Why would you put your most expensive personal? <laughs> like, don't you want somebody to take all that paperwork off your off your desk? So we were both surprised by that. Although one of them did say that was a mistake, and they learned that you know they learned from that and then went for a support person. 
So then the next session um, we both quite liked was talking about um, communicating better with clients, engaging with them, using comms as a better way to engage. Um, and that was an interesting, I thought that was an interesting panel because, and you made this point, I think, one of the, so there was quite a mix of approaches. Um, one person hasn't been using AI at all for content, yeah, they're doing it all manually, spending a lot of time. Um, others using it as inspiration, but there was a lot of interesting insights out of this that I thought were really powerful. What stood out for you out of this session? So for me, this is about communication to your client. So your current, current clients, yeah, so not marketing clients. out. No, it's, yeah. I, I, I talk about internal communication. And sometimes we forget about that. We spend more time on our you know, external marketing to new clients rather than this, this. And the reason why it was important because they did some research here and it probably would be fairly similar stats I'd say in Australia. That sixty only sixty two percent of of clients that we interviewed were not comfortable with their financial plan, and seventy five percent were thinking of changing their financial advisor. Now those sort of stats, where they're not comfortable with their plan, they're thinking of leaving, is because of the communication breakdown. Mm. And so they spoke about getting into a communication rhythm, so that your clients and one of the, the guys that spoke, he spoke about you know having at least a touch point or piece of communication that touches your clients at least once a week. Which that sounds like a lot. I've got to say, like my instant reaction was, oh, yes. And I, I know you yeah, I advise the buddies to listen to this thinking, we don't have private to do all that. Don't stress. Don't get all of it. Just pick one or two to start with and then you can always build. I'm sure he didn't start with all of them to start with. But what I think was interesting is he spoke about having multiple formats of communication. Mm-hmm. And so how do your clients want to be communicated with? It's not just going to be via email. So he spoke about things like, you know, um, socials and text message and the events. We both love the, um, you know, the event strategy that they yes. use. Yeah, that was, that was interesting. So when we say events, like workshops or webinars. Yeah. And online. So online. Or, you know, online. virtual. This is not you hosting a whole lot of people uh, and having a late cost. So this could be a workshop on all sorts of things you think might be valuable. And I love this one-two punch they did where they said, yeah, you invite your clients to the webinar. Yeah. And then... Um, the second email that maybe was a week later, say, would say, oh, look, we've had so much interest in this topic. Um, we've got some spots. If you'd like to email this to two or three of your friends, we'd be happy to include them in the workshop. Mm-hmm. So um, what a wonderful, subtle way to get referrals uh, and to have people see you um, demonstrate both your thought leadership, your skill and style and personality, right? Yeah. Like see um, what you like. I thought that was really on the money, actually. Um, yeah, I, I love that concept. I also like that they spoke about email quite a bit. Multiple people, not just this session, spoke about email. And I know we can sometimes groan about email. Uh, but they're still using it as one of their core strategies. And they're saying that because they're creating content that but we spoke about the importance of ta- um, segmenting a list. Yes. About, um, having your email, when we talk about segmenting a list, you want to make sure that you're not just sending the same message to everyone, that we've got like targeted uh, you know, emails that go to certain segments. So I think that is making sure the right content gets to the right people. And just, sorry, just to dive into that a little further, Adele, <laughs> I think for many of us, like we think, oh, that means I have three categories, do I? Or something like yeah. I think we probably oversimplify in that sense. I, when When one of the panelists was talking about the tags, you know, tag your business business owners, tag yes, the demographic, tag what they're interested in, tag in the risk profile they have, tag like all of that because then if you've got one com going out um, on a particular topic, you could do, if you wanted to, 12 versions. Mm. But, and that may sound crazy, A, you can use ChatGPT to help you do that, but B, how personal does that feel when they get something that is literally tailored to them? Mm. Um and the pers- this personalization point came up a lot today, didn't it? It did in a lot of different sessions. Um, and I think it's the way to really get traction with people. And I guess the other thing I'd note too is when they're saying this, you know, weekly thing, what I realized is they're counting every bit of touch points. So any of the meetings you're having, any of the follow-up calls, any of the SMSs, if you map that out over a year, there's a lot of those already taken up just with your normal process. So it's about, I use the expression of filling the gap and that's what you're trying to do. So it may mean you don't have a uh, a monthly cycle, say, of a newsletter. You actually map it out and go, well, well, how often should that be? So it fills the gap. 
you know, so I thought that was interesting to think about it a bit, dif- bit differently. Yeah, I, I did too. I yeah. also love that they spoke about the importance of the subject heading on emails and yes. not all in a newsletter. Uh, because no one, if you if you have like newsletter or market update and you're having the same yeah. subject all the time, yeah. no one's going to open those emails. They're going to probably end up in spam and yeah. junk mail. Yeah. So the yeah, spending as much time on the actual heading is as important as what you put into the, the content. So you want to make it something that people actually want to open. Yeah. And so saying newsletter or March newsletter or something is just not going to you know, cut it. Yeah, 100%. Um, so... Then after that, look, where did we go then? Oh, okay. So I went to a session um, that was about effective decision making. Now, this was interesting because for our practice, um, just to give context, we're doing a lot more um, coaching around major lifestyle decisions. And interestingly enough, often that can be far less financial. (laughs) So if somebody's just having to make a big call, should we downsize maybe or should we move to the country or should I go and you know start a completely new career or some of these big things and people just get caught in in challenges and decision made mazes and end up procrastinating and all sorts of things this gentleman was his name was Matthew Confer he's done a TEDx talk back in 2019 I'd encourage you to check it out because he had a very what what was quite a simple decision making model but what was interesting about it was so he started the session saying what we probably don't realize is that most of us, like over 80% of us, think we are above average at things. So how, do you, how would you rate you as a driver? Yeah, I'm above average. But you can't have 80% of people being above average. Those maths don't work, right? So, but this is just human nature. And so what that means when we're running, say, a project and we're making decisions about how that will work we overestimate our ability to pull it off. And so this is where things can go asunder. And so one of the first things he had in his sort of three-step process was that you're looking at a new decision or a new project or a new idea. The first thing is to actually challenge the constraints. So say, yeah, oh, we think we've got to do this. We think we've got to rebrand. We think we've got to have a new website, whatever it is, challenge the constraints. If the thing you're trying to work out is, do we need to redo our website? Maybe challenging the constraints mean, means, do you need one at all? Or is there something else you should have? Like, it's just really questioning the very nature of the decision you're trying to make um, and to dive into that. Uh, and it was very, very interesting. He also talked about having a pre-mortem. So we've all all heard of post-mortems, particularly after sport. <laughs> we all talk about how it went and everything. A pre-mortem is when you try and think of every possible way it can fail. And you dive into that. And by diving into that, you can then think of strategies to address that. So you're actually increasing the likelihood you'll succeed because you've considered all the ways it can go wrong. Um, And so they've done a lot of this in, you know, work with some big corporates and found this massively improves the outcomes for teams. So I thought it was quite interesting. I went there, you know, focused for clients and I think it will be valuable for that. But it stood out to me that, you know, there's a whole lot of work we can do better when we're rolling out change, when we're doing new tech implementations, all this sort of stuff that could just mean we save ourselves some pain and suffering, to be honest. Um, so I really liked that session. That was really effective. So you went to one about demographics, right? Of I did. I went to a lady called Megan Kelly, and it was all around um, demographics and trends that were happening which reason why it's important to understand that is it means that our advice will have to change and how we give advice will change. So you know, as an ex- example, people are having few children. There's also a trend towards having no children. So how do you do estate planning for someone that has no children? What sort of discussions will you need to have with them? Mm. So I thought that was interesting. And then the new path to adulthood. They said, you know, financial planning had this traditional path of, you know, uni, job, marriage, kids. But there's now these new paths to adulthood where kids and marriage may not even be part of it. So, so things like, you know, people won't be having engagement parties anymore. They'll maybe have parties to celebrate when they paid out their student debt. All right. Yeah. Well. Um, so, but, uh, but other trends like people will have many retirements throughout their career. So that means that things like cash flow and cash flow planning right. become more important rather than waiting for retirement. Yep. Uh, he, they also spoke about the you know, success changing for people and the definite and success and and wealth being not just net worth, but wealth is going to be things like 
experiences that you have, their time and health, people are going to value those things. And so how do we need to reposition our conversation so we have the clients so that it focuses on those things? So yeah, I just thought it was super interesting and it just made me really think about, you know, what's like how we would need to change our advice conversations and also realize that that goal-based advice, having those discussions is going to just become even more important. It is. And and so interesting because what you're also saying there, what I'm hearing is, is we've got to stop thinking people's lives are linear. Yeah. They're just not. And they're going to be jumping all over the place. And to be honest, they probably should. They probably, you know, they'll have all these different careers and maybe they'll start a side hustle and maybe they'll do, we just can't do the 2.5 kids white picket fence approach anymore. And look, I'd say that the big institutions need to hear this too. You know, it's there's too much messaging. There's too many, even the products really do treat somebody like there's just one path. Mm. And it's it's simply not the case. You are so right. And, and you know, people might, we joked about how, you know, it maybe isn't a baby moon. It's maybe it's a retirement moon. Or maybe people are having mm. different little trips or holidays or time off or like all of this is going to change. And we need to be... A, open-minded enough not to freak out when a client says that um, and B, be ready for how we can factor that in for them. Yeah, it could also be their kids. Yes. So I I imagine, you know, if you're a parent and you've got, you know, children that age, it's going to be hard for you not to think about them. So maybe you can help now our clients. Maybe it's a good event you could talk about and and changings you could do for them. They have an expert come in to talk about this so that they don't feel like, you know, there's that their children are on the wrong path. And yes, this is uh, that's true, isn't it? Actually, because I think we're so used to the way we were brought up and the way what we experienced as being the normal. The truth is, that's not the case anymore. It's simply not. And they may not have houses. No, may not be the priority. That doesn't mean they'll fail. It's yes, different. Yes, the yeah, your success is different. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, I then went to a session actually run by a lady from LinkedIn. The poor thing was six months pregnant. So we're in, yeah, we're outdoors. Luckily it was under a tent, but she was clearly overheating a bit, doing quite well, but then also um, puffed, you know, (laughs) standing there. She's like, does everybody mind if I sit on stage? So she was, they got her a chair and she was sitting on, on stage, but she was really good. So she, her role in LinkedIn is actually coaching, would you believe, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies to start putting content out on LinkedIn. Mm. I thought, whoa, that's interesting, right? And imagine dealing with some of them. I mean, bless her cotton socks. That must be a challenge. But um, she did talk a lot about how um, there are just some key things we can all do to lift our game on LinkedIn. And one of them is when we post the, you know, the algorithm and just people reading it, the response rate is much higher from content that just has clear, actionable takeaways. Two to three. In, you know, two to three insights or two to three things to do or two to three, like it just make it really clear. Um, yes, use story telling. Yes, do all of that, but always have takeaways for people. Even to the point she said, if you do link to something externally, it may be an article or it may be something else, a blog we've written or whatever, make sure your caption still has the highlights and the takeaways. So because, you know, this is a feed, people are scrolling, you've got to attract enough of their interest to get them even to click through to something and the days of somebody just thinking wow that link might be interesting it just go on that's not how and we all know that our behavior is like that right if you just share a link to me i'm not necessarily i'm not going to click on it so the other thing she did talk about is is always think about um the first line so making sure that it's got a strong opener and you can see that i'm used to seeing that now on post but a strong closer what do you want them to do? Ask them to do something. Like, do you want them to reach out? Do you want them to comment? Do you want them to DM? Do whatever? Like, what what is the thing um, that you want them to do? So, and interestingly, what was so interesting about the tips she gave, none of this was difficult or complicated or involved. You know, it just was consistency and having some structure to things. So, the other thing she talked about was um, their video content. They're finding that it performs one point four times more but it's short form vertical video content, right? So those um, stand-up videos. <laughs> yeah, I found that with my own LinkedIn that I would say years ago, video wasn't getting the reach, mm. but now short, 
with captions. It's got to have captions on the video. Yeah. Because most people will watch without the sound on. Yep. And then also, my pro tip, don't like put it from YouTube link or anything like that because LinkedIn doesn't like it when you take people off LinkedIn. No. And so upload the video straight into LinkedIn. Into LinkedIn. Um, so the aspect ratio we're talking about there is at 9 by 16. As she said, like ideally under 90 seconds. Now that's interesting, mm-hmm. right? Because I think w- because it's LinkedIn and it's professional, I think we feel maybe we can pontificate a bit more. But clearly, no, you cannot pontificate. Oh, we're going to be more concise. So she said, if that means you've got to just give, you know, one insight to keep it at 90 seconds, she said, that's better than letting it go longer. So I thought that's interesting, right? So it might mean you do a series of posts, right? And you say in the video, hey, this is the first one. Um, I'll do another one in a couple of days with the second tip. Like you could do it that way, but it was these short, punchy um, bits of video content. Uh, so yeah, I thought she she was really interesting and I loved that it just wasn't crazy rocket science. It was just sensible tips. Um, then the last one we both attended, no surprises here, folks, you know, we both love tech. So it was about humanizing your practice with tech. These were these people were interesting, actually. So, what Adele out of this session? What were your highlights? Well, they talked about the human element, and I think one of the things that they were able to do is build community with their with their clients, right? And so, their clients connected with each other. The clients knew each other. They encouraged, you know, that connection. They went for a trip to Africa with their clients, right? So. Yeah. Wow. So I thought that that was it was interesting, and I think they only know that because they understood their clients deeply. Yes. And so when they have that connection with them, then those sort of things they got you know buy into, and that would be you you'd need to have picked a niche right for that to work because otherwise you're not going to be able to pick the right thing that you all do together if they're all from wildly different that's backgrounds right. or whatever. So we, so this will only work if you're niching um, for sure. Uh, they also, I thought it was interesting what they were talking about because they acknowledge a number of them are operating in sort of the midlife space. Um, and they said, you know, these clients are living, are very busy people and they're living, what was the expression she used? Um, 11 second bite-sized world. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the clients actually want things to be more concise, take less time, um, smaller interactions which I thought was interesting. And so therefore using tech that will let, you know, reach into all of the different notes you have and help you prepare beforehand for the meeting so that you can have a deeper conversation faster. That was interesting, you know, because we all do feel like you've got to take time with things. But if we can get a grasp on where we got to last time really quickly and it gives us some context to take us there even further in the next conversation, then the AI across all of our information, I mean, that's a, I love that because it's going beyond efficiency. That's, that's connection. You know, it's enhancing the relationship with the client, uh, which I think is exciting as a use for AI, for sure. Any other things that stood out for you out of that session? Oh, just how they spoke about how the content can't you know we want content to educate and inform but it can also inspire and motivate entertain people so uh um, and then the other content session too spoke about you know content not just being a technical but sharing your personal stuff as well so when we think about content and how we communicate with our clients or for marketing we want to think about you know changing the type of content not just having the same thing all the time so yeah okay um and the last one i had out of that session actually was they one in particular they were taking so if you're using um, any of the meeting tools the ai meeting tools then you'll have data across meetings meaning you'll not just for one client across all of them right so let's imagine in the last month you could then talk to ai about all of the meetings that people have been having with clients in your team and draw out keywords themes or frequently asked questions say and create content that responds to that so then your clients feel really heard because they'll have had a chat to their advisor one-on-one, but the next thing that the blog or the whatever that comes out or video that the business produces literally addresses the things they were talking about. So I thought that's clever. That's a way to not have to recreate the wheel, right? You can just use your client base and the conversations you're having with your clients to sort of inspire the next piece of content. 
absolutely to help them more, but also from a marketing point of view, what words are they using? Yes. If you've got all your you know, ideal clients that you'd have and you're seeing some common words that they use to describe their problem, yeah. that's what you want to put in your LinkedIn description. That's what you put on your web page, the yes. words that they say. Because when you can articulate the problem like they say it, yeah. that's when you get that connection with your ideal client. And that yeah. they just assume that you have the solution. When you can when you can articulate it like that they feel, like yes. their problem. So, yeah, that, I mean, you could use it to communicate with your current client, but also for, for prospecting Attract as well. Them. Yeah, new ones. All righty, so that was day two, folks. We, um, we've got day three and, in fact, a half a day four coming. Day three, I think there's, oh, well, I've got a ton of those meetings too, so I'll be able to report back on how they go. Got another round table. Right. So we'll be able to see, you know, did it get weirder, better, stranger? We go, let see what happens. Um, and we've got an actual music festival happening tomorrow night as well. So um, there's a whole lot of gigs, one after the other. Good eye blind. Is right. So we'll report back and see how many, you know, how it looks with a whole lot of geeky finance people all on the dance floor. I'm sure it'll be hysterical. I uh, will look forward to updating you then. 